The point I made already in the discussion is that nanotechnology, and we have said that before, is very complicated. It's a very complex scientific discipline, and medicine is the same. So we have lots of application area. Pharmaceutical, uh, diagnostics, and regenerative medicine are very, very different areas. So actually, there is no nanomedicine, but there's only nano in or for medicine. So nanomedicine is, or medicine, nano is only part of the story. And we have to be aware of that. And that's what I meant when we discuss ethical questions. I think we have to discuss medicine and what nanotechnology can do to it. And that's, uh, that's what I made the point before. So where is nano in medicine? I think we have seen that before, but I just wanted to make some points. It's um, on diagnostic, of course, in surface of implants, materials for smart devices, and scaffold for tissue engineering. And I thought I'd give you some um, some um, uh, examples where nano might be part of the story and what that means. Of course, we have implants for years now. I mean, hip implants are a routine and, and others also. But of course, there are ways of improvement where nanotechnology can help. And if you look at corrosion of these hip implants, you can see that there is a lot of room for improvements. And or maybe surface uh, modifications of implants can prevent these kind of corrosions where patients have to uh, be taken out, or these things have to be taken out after five or ten years from patients because they are corroded. Now, the ethical issues, of course, then you can ask, especially if you go to the first slide, how many parts can I exchange to be still the same person? So then we come to this enhancement idea uh, again. Um, this is, again, the question between medical treatment and enhancement, and he gave a wonderful example of uh, how pro problematic this is. But also the question is um, the high cost for nano implants to be balanced uh, by the cost of the health system. And this is a very, very interesting ethical question in this regard where you keep replacing parts of the body. The question is uh, how long can you do it? How much does it cost? And so on. Now, telemedicine is also an area where nano plays a lot of role. It's not only in the, in the body where you can put all kinds of sensors which tell you if you are standing, lying, or walking, or whatever. And uh, think about the Google uh, initiative we heard about where you have nanoparticles circulating in your blood and your watch tells you from Google if you are sick or not or what kind of uh, thing you have. Uh, so there is a lot of things happening, and there are, again, specific issues which you don't have with implants, of course. Control of data, how are they protected? Also, the communication between doctor and patient. I mean, you don't go to the doctor's office anymore. You, he gets your data, and he sends you an email back and says, take three pills of this or that, or come to my office, or go to the hospital. And that is, is changing quite a bit. Of course, the right to know and not to know. I mean, if your data uh, read out, uh, the question is, do you know, do you want to know all these side effects, which also might be in the data? I think a very important area or very big paradigm shift is that we more and more by better diagnosis go from treatment of clinical symptoms, so where you <coughs> kind of feel sick uh, and have a diagnosis and treatment and follow up, we go more and more to preemptive medicine where you have a screening, early diagnosis, preventive medicine, and, and so on. So, you know, get looking at your uh, genome and predicting what kind of disease you might have in 10 years, or you take a biomarker which uh, circulates in your blood maybe with two uh, molecules per liter. And uh, then the question, of course, is how can you detect the biomarker, but when are you ill? I mean, the, the, the definition of disease is uh, a big issue which we face in the future because uh, being able to predict that you might get a, get a disease doesn't tell you anything because you might or might not get it. Uh, but even with the biomarker is also the question, uh, do you have to stay at home because your biomarker has been detected and you might get sick in, sick in, in whatever year? And what does your health insurance say to that? Of course, with all these predictions, the question of reliability uh, comes into place. And also, is there social pressure to undergo this screening? And uh, again, then, of course, the right to know and not to know comes in uh, here really dramatically. 
very specific to medicine is that in the electronics business, you have a very uh, straightforward value chain where science and technology kind of work together with industry. Then you have a product and then you have it on the market. I mean, you have a change in TV uh, every two, three years and you get your mobile phones developed very fast. In medicine, it's very different. You have all these, you know, proof of concept trials, preclinical trials. You have to go through all this uh, before industry really takes over. So the question there is the question of translation we heard already here uh, today about. Um, how can you make this step and what's happening in, in this bubble there and uh, how can we cope with that? Here, of course, then is because it gets more and more expensive, uh, who pays for that? And then, again, who has then access to it? Because if your health insurance does not pay it, who can afford these uh, new inventions? Um, and that is, of course, a question of regulation versus company revenues. How many regulations can we put in place that companies still earn enough money to make new uh, developments? And uh, all this is also a very ethical and social question. And then, of course, the cost and benefit relation for personal medicine. And there is another question, of course. Um, if you say, I think it was 70% don't react to medicine. What happens to the 70% if there is a medicine which had 30% but not the 70%? Are they then die because they, there's no medicine? Or does pharma then look for other treatments? Um, I don't know how this is um, really um, cared about. And that basically comes down to the question, is it a patient or a cost-driven system? Right now we have a cost-driven system. Uh, everything which is too expensive uh, will not be on the market or you have to pay yourself. And it's not asking. Um, well, it's asking to, to, to a certain extent if it helps the patient, but this is not driving uh, actually what uh, innovation comes to the market. So I think we have to discuss these ethical issues in these different areas differently. Um, and then we also have to discuss medical needs versus risk of R&D. What I mean with that was the project you showed with the bubble, with the bubble, um, <coughs> But blood with BBB, let's put it this way. I was asking myself, okay, you can do this in rats, you can do this in an artificial system, but will it ever have the chance to go to the clinic? Because yes, it has been done in Paris. Okay, but this is one of the questions which you would ask in these kind of things. Will it go to the clinic because it fits to the clinical routine? Do you find an industry which produces all these kind of equipment or whatever, um, to justify all the animal assays uh, you do, because uh, if you, industry would tell you before, we never touch it because it's too complicated or whatever, you, could not, you wouldn't have to do it unless you would do uh, basic research. It's not criticizing, it's, it's just the questions we try to answer with this new EU project where we try to establish an advisory board which kind of, so kind of soften the translation um, translation, what was it, um, tragedy, that was the word, uh, the translation tragedy at least to some extent because you get more information if translation makes sense or not. If you should make the first step into the first clinical trial, if you have enough characterize uh, your project for toxicity and all these kind of things, if you ask industry if it's producible or not, or clinicians, do we need it or not, so all these kind of questions are answered before. So then it helps you to make a decision, uh, do I go to clinical trials or don't I go to clinical trials? Um, then, of course, um, we also have to ask patients. Uh, we have to get a feeling if preemptive diagnostic makes sense or if simply patients don't want it because they don't want to know it. And they don't, and you know this breast uh, screening for women, a lot of women go, don't go there because they don't want to know it. Um, of course, health insurances also have to revise their cost models. I mean, if, if we go for screening, the question is, is it cheaper to screen 10,000 people to find two, two incidences, or is it easier to find these incident, two incidences when there are symptoms and then treat them? Because the treatment might be very expensive, uh, so these kind of cost models um, have to uh, be revised. And of course, value change. I mean, you have your company, companion diagnostics, IT, biotech, nanotech, all these have to go together. And that changes the way different industries work together in, kind, in, in, in a certain way. And that, of course, 
also puts pressure on the regulators because they have to learn because we get new um, kind of smart bullets, these uh, devices which are, could be either uh, regime or could be either regulated in one or the other regime. And also, of course, the social security system has to adapt to the aging population anyway. But if you think about regenerative medicine, if it really would be possible by regenerative medicine to cure diabetes, because you can kind of put stem cells in there, they recreate the cells which make your insulin, then all this treatment of these chronic patients would go away, which would be a tremendous cost saving. The question is how much money does it cost to, to put it there and, and how does the social uh, system cope with this because these people all of a sudden don't have all these secondary illnesses and so on. So in, in the, the consequence is that I think when you make all these, when you answer all these questions, when you have these things in mind, non medicine is a very nice test case for implementation of the responsible research and innovation approach, which has been already mentioned several times today. Um, because uh, here you have a new technology, you have uh, already experience in a lot of these biomedical ethical questions, so you can find kind of, you know what you are asking, you know uh, in what kind of regime you are. But I think then also you should be able to get the information. You should be able to have courses like this or you have to have uh, nearby some training sources who can actually give you information about what kind of questions they are, how you can treat them. And uh, of course, if we talk about <coughs> funding agencies who require these kind of things, then they have to be, make sure that they bring the information, but also that the evaluation panels treat these questions in the right way. So uh, it doesn't, it's not like an ethics board, but somebody said, I want also somebody who I can talk to, so to figure out what kind of questions there are. So how do I have to react and how do I have to kind of make my project uh, going to work? So I think what we need is a really a communication between all these different stakeholders. It's patients, healthcare providers, insurances, industry, academics, authorities, and regulators. So I think this is one of the lessons I have learned in all these discussions, also on the white paper of nanomedicine uh, we wrote with the EGP, <coughs> that it has to be a communication uh, and a learning from each other among all these stakeholders because none of them alone can do this and I think it has to start early uh, to see the consequences early enough and to think about them early enough. So maybe it's good to have another nanomate round table. You were involved and I think maybe it's time to have a follow up to look at the ethical, regulator, social, economic environment of nanomedicine because we have learned a lot. Several products are on the market and we could actually then make kind of a comparison of maybe predictions we had five or ten years ago and what has happened in the meantime. Um, I also think we need these kind of round tables, funded or not, um, with these different stakeholders and um, then we might be able to come up with criteria actions to implement the research, uh, the responsible research and innovation principle in R&D projects. Um, I think it's a long way to go there because I'm also a little bit reluctant to kind of overburden scientists with these kind of things because it, need, it, it has to be a process that scientists learn to ask these questions, to cope with these questions, to understand the degree of or the level they have to cope with or they have to address and so we cannot just say okay from 2015 we put these requirements on, on a proposal. Um, no, I think we first we have to get the information, we have to s kind of have the discussions among each other to set the right criteria and the right structures and, and forms. And then of course um, <clears throat> that's what I said is to have the right information and uh, like a translation advisory board, and then um, have the right criteria to improve this. That was all I wanted to say uh, at the moment. I think we had a wonderful discussion and we can continue this discussion uh, for a little bit at least. Um, my message is okay, I understand what has been said today, but I think not only the scientists are asked to 
cope with these and to, to discuss these questions, but there are other stakeholders who have to be included, who have to help, also have to learn, so that in the end we come up with an ethically and socially sound development of nanomedicine in Europe. Well, and I hope we will get there, and I think a, a workshop like this is fantastic for this kind of spreading the idea. Because if you go home now and tell these people what you have learned here and about these questions, you are kind of a multiplicator <coughs> for these issues. And I think this is important because we have to um, bring these questions to the community. And we have not enough of these kind of uh, uh, um, workshops for the community where people get simply be aware of the questions and be aware of the ethical and social implications <coughs> and thinking. And um, therefore, I'm very happy to be part of this. Thank you.